main theme, the core of what I would like to speak about um, in this talk is um, the true cost of healthy food. That's my introduction, healthy, and I'd like, I'll speak about that a bit in a moment. Um, because I think that uh, that's really unlocking that issue is one of the keys to the expansion of the sustainable food and agriculture movement. Um, but before I do that, I think I want to just make a, a few opening reflections and also share with you my kind of potted history of the development of agriculture during the last century, because I think it gives some context to the debate about the true cost of healthy food. I'm glad that um, Charles mentioned um, the issue of the spiritual roots, both of Triodos Bank, but also perhaps of many of our interest in these issues, because it does seem to me that in the end, um, our lives involve a search for a higher purpose of some kind, however we define that to be, and that money and the financial world should serve that higher purpose. That isn't to say that we, we mustn't be worldly in the way that we engage with things, and money is at the core of that. But in the end, there's something else that drives us. And to give that sort of wider perspective on things, one can imagine our planet as surrounded by this extraordinary thin film of organic life and ask ourselves what the question, what the purpose of that organic life is, what's its higher purpose, and what, what role can we play as the cells of this enormous biosphere on an individual level which will add to the higher purpose of things. And for me, that's something, a question which I, I live with and I want to remain asking for the rest of my life. There were stirrings of the development of industrial agriculture which go right back to the beginning of the 20th century. And maybe the preconditions then are with us today, some of the preconditions. Um, food insecurity, wars and conflicts, the first and then the second world wars, and now of course we've got a lot of other conflicts, many of which can be traced back at least in part to food insecurity. And now we've got a lot more problems to add to that. But also at the beginning of the 20th century, we'd mastered the art of nitrogen fixation through the Harbour Bosch process, which enabled, of course, developed as a, an explosive originally, but it enabled farmers to be liberated from the tyranny of building soil fertility through crop rotation. At least that's how it was seen at the time. And that gave rise, combined with the food insecurity concerns arising from wars and conflicts, to a, a, a major chapter of agricultural intensification which spanned the whole of the last century and arguably is still continuing. And there were various people who, right at the beginning of that period, stood out and said, this isn't a sensible direction to go in. One of them, of course, was Rudolf Steiner, um, who talked about, in his agricultural lectures uh, in June 1924, about the need to understand that if we wish to maintain and grow the vitality of the crops and the animal products which we depend on for our positive health, we need to move away from a chemical way of thinking towards a biological and a spiritual way of thinking. And our agricultural practices need to take into account the inf those finer influences on organic life. And he gave precise indications 90 years ago as to how farmers should go about enhancing the vitality of the food crops they grew, interestingly enough, derived from the observations of East German farmers who were noticing a decline in the vitality of their crops. But his, his, his insights and impulses, although they gave rise to the, de the development of the biodynamic movement, which is a very important movement and very vital today, uh, arguably were swept away uh, by the tidal movement towards agricultural intensification, as were the observations of Sir Albert Howard, uh, who was sent to India to teach northwestern Indian peasant farmers how to nourish themselves, but had the humility to realize that he had nothing to teach them because they were practicing the law of return, and the result were, was healthy soils, which resulted in healthy plants, animals, and people. And he stayed in India, 
studying agriculture from the peasant farmers that he referred to as his professors, and then wrote a book 35 years later on his return to England in 1940 called An Agricultural Testament, in which he made certain observations, including uh, one that really strikes me is that he said that if, an, if, a, if, if a nation industrializes its agriculture, it will end up with a population of phys physical and mentally impaired health. And I think we're witnessing the consequences two generations later and more of the, the long-term impact of a massive feeding trial which is going on in the whole of Western agriculture. And he also said that we need to regard pests, parasites and diseases as nature's professors of health because they will reveal to us our management deficiencies. In other words, instead of seeing the, the problems as something we have to suppress, we have to learn from them and we have to alter our agricultural practice accordingly. And then, of course, there was Lady Eve Balfour, who read Howard's book, An Agricultural Testament, was inspired by it and set up the Soil Association in 1946. And she said, instead of treating the symptoms of disease, we should be investigating the causes of health. Now, what a profound observation that is. But sadly, Howard's brilliance and Lady Eve's vision were ignored, again, because of the sheer relentless pressure of industrialization, which was stronger than all these these early warnings. So there followed a chapter of agricultural intensification. And some of the key features of that chapter, which is ongoing, are specialization, reducing things to single crops and single commodities, ignoring the principle of diversity, the artificial stimulation of growth, mainly using nitrogen fertilizer and other soluble fertilizers, which inevitably results in diminished vitality of crops and of course, as Howard observed, the response to that is nature's professor manifesting as disease and pests and weeds. But rather than observe that there must be something wrong with our agricultural practice, the chemists came along and said, don't worry, we can suppress the fungal diseases in cereals, we can spray the pests with pesticides, and we can deal with the weed problems, which are the result of monocultural rotations with herbicides. So it's the artificial stimulation of growth and the suppression of the inevitable resultant, resultant symptoms with a whole range of chemicals. It's also, as has just been mentioned, the depletion of natural capital, which because we don't value it, because we don't put a price on nature, we've been practicing false accounting on a massive scale. Our agriculture and food systems wouldn't survive a proper audit today, although... It, It, it has to be said that uh, one wonders whether some of the leading firms of auditors get that, because if they properly costed ecological uh, depletion of natural capital, then we wouldn't be in the mess we're in. But I think there are signs that something can be done about that. And then, of course, there's working in silos. Even within the sustainable food and environmental movement, we've been working in silos. One example is that the environmental organisations inspired by Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, in 1962, understood correctly that agriculture was the problem, but instead of dealing with the problem agriculture, they, they embarked upon a brilliantly successful, in its terms, chapter of the creation of nature reserves, which in, implied a tacit acceptance that mainstream agriculture couldn't be altered and it was inevitable we have to use these modern methods if we needed to produce if we were going to produce enough to feed uh, to feed a, a global population and the problem with that has been that it is that it's been in the public mind nature and biodiversity has been separated from food production when if we could have got we, what we should have done all the way along was to change agriculture and to make sure that farmers could farm in such a way that nature could coexist I think many of the environmental organizations are coming to that conclusion now because they published a report called The State of Nature in the spring of 2013, which recognized that despite all their fantastic efforts, the relentless decline in biodiversity has continued uh, throughout the last 40 or 50 years, despite the fact that they have memberships in millions of people, whereas the sustainable food movement has a pitifully small membership. So I'm really saying that um, we failed to break through and engage, and we, uh, because of that, something has to change. And then the last feature, I, I think, of um, industrial food systems is sleep. It appears that 
Most people haven't woken up to what I've just been describing uh, because the system goes on. We continue to use these inputs. We continue to produce cheap, adulterated food from industrial farming, which increasingly clearly is not only destroying biodiversity but impacting on public health, and yet nobody seems to make the connection. So maybe it's the bad food which has dulled our minds, which is what Howard said all those years ago. So something needs to be done about this. And, of course, a lot has been done, and I uh, came in, I became involved in the second, as it were, chapter, the new wave of the organic movement back in the early 70s. I can't go into the history of my farm now, it would take too long, but basically I've been on the same piece of land for over 40 years, and uh, I started as a commune, and it went through various phases, and here I still am, with the help of Triodos Bank, it has to be said. Um, but my day job from the late 80s onwards to work, was to work in the Soil Association and the wider organic movement to try to build a platform, a survival platform really, an economic survival platform, so that I could continue, to, we could, and others could continue to farm in an environment which is essentially hostile to sustainable agriculture. If I'm honest, I could say that we didn't really understand why that was the case at the time. We just knew it was. So we, th we had this bright idea. Why don't we write down what we're doing, a prescription for sustainable agriculture, take our story to the public and ask them to support us in the marketplace? We thought if we did that, and all farmers did that, we'd sort all the problems out. Now if we fast forward, whatever it is, 30 years or so, what do we see? Well, we see that the organic movement has been a great success and that we've built a market which peaked at around 2.6 billion back in around eight, uh, 2008, but has been declining since then for various reasons, part of which are related to the recession, obviously, but there are other factors involved, which we might discuss later. But if you add the combined value of all the sustainable, local, organic, and every other food movement together, it's, if you're incredibly generous, you could say it's 5% of the food market. And in fact, 95% of the, the food production system and market is still going in the opposite direction for what is needed. Because now we have climate change, critical resource depletion, major public health problems which are costing billions and billions of pounds in health service bills, growing food insecurity, and the need to change all our farming systems, not just a part of them, if we're going to address these massive and unprecedented challenges. So, I think that all, for all the good work that's been done in many of the organizations throughout the food movement and the environmental movement and the animal welfare movement, we have to recognize that confronted by these new challenges, we have to change. Because, it, because what we did in the past, whilst it might have been right then, it clear, clearly doesn't address the challenges we stand in front of today. So some sort of new impulse is needed. It needs to be more inclusive. I think the way in which we've polarized the environmental movements stance against industrial agriculture has to give way to something which is more constructive without abandoning our intellectual rigor. We need to befriend these people with our common humanity but at the same time challenge them forensically where we need to on the issues where we think we've got, they've got it wrong. I think that can be done and I also think that we need some kind of new metric system for assessing sustainability because one of the problems of the organic market for all its good features, and I'm an organic farmer, we're, we're producing organic food on our farm, and will continue to do, is that it polarizes those that do from those that don't. And I think we need some sort of new set of metrics and indices which rewards incremental sustainability, so that the more sustainable you are, the more points you get, and the more good you feel. And everyone's on that journey, as opposed to the organic movement, morally superior, preachy, full of ourselves, and you know, thinking we're great and everybody else is the great unwashed and, you know, needs to become organic or they're sinners. And I think that has created a lot of bad energy and we need to do something about that without abandoning the market because I'm not for a moment suggesting that we should abandon the market. I think the market is critical. Market mechanisms are critical. But the market mechanisms have to work with other instruments to ensure that we're not operating against such a strong economic headwind that we're never going to break through. And that's the truth at the moment. So that really brings me to my new work in the Sustainable Food Trust. This started in 2010 when I stepped down as director of the Soil Association. 
I'd made a lot of international contacts during my time at the Soil Association, and I participated in a number of meetings which brought together some of the leaders of the food and environmental movement, and we all concluded that we'd been working in silos, and we needed some sort of new collective energy if we were going to break through into the mainstream. And out of that, the idea of forming the Sustainable Food Trust came, a small organisation. It will remain small because we want to work catalytically, not replicate the work of all the great organisations that are already out there doing good work, with an aim of accelerating the transition globally towards more sustainable food systems, but working in such a way that local and individual action is the key to the change, because that's what I certainly believe. We are both global and local as citizens of planet Earth, and we need to make sense of the, the world by understanding ourselves and our own context. So I, I strongly feel this sense of macrocosm and microcosm and the interconnectedness between the two. So that brings me finally to my theme. Uh, we're working, the Sustainable Food Trust is working in three areas. The first area is building collaborative partnerships between individuals and organizations with their interest in all this. And that involves some public stuff, but some private stuff. Mm. For instance, just to give an example, building strong connections with the leaders of some of the environmental organizations all over the world, and also the foundations, who, some of which have been funding the wrong kind of development work, work which involve fertilizers and hybrid seeds in Africa, for instance, or conservation organizations that are just intent on creating nature reserves and are not grappling with the problems which are stopping more farmers being able to change to truly sustainable methods. So that's kind of influence at a leadership level, but also just building organizational partnerships as well. The second area of work is looking at the policy and economic and research environment, the sum of the work of which hopefully can create better conditions for sustainable food systems to grow. And the third area is communications. And we do have a weekly newsletter. Those that don't yet subscribe to it, it's free. And if you go onto our website, you can subscribe to it. And I think that it will connect you up with some of these issues I've been describing, in, at least in a, a reasonably effective way. But one project, one initiative, which has preoccupied us very much over the last two years, is the theme of true cost accounting in food and farming. This issue is about how the economics of our present farming and food systems are distorted in a number of different ways. The polluter's not paying. If you diminish natural capital, you don't pay the price for that. It's as if it's free or largely free. And farmers who are adopting practices which deliver beneficial public and environmental outcomes are not financially rewarded for so doing. And as a direct result of that, if you look at the business case for farming, if you're a farmer now, a young farmer going to farming, you want to make the most possible money, there's a better business case for using nitrogen fertilizer and pesticides and farming intensively and moving towards monoculture than there is to go into a diverse, sustainable, organic, biodynamic, and socially and environmentally rewarding system. And I know about this because I'm, I've experienced it. You know, if I'm honest, I would say that although I'm moving towards, I hope one day, where the farm will be more economically viable, my day job throughout the time I've been farming the last 20 years has been critical to support what we're trying to do back on the farm. Now, some of it's building the infrastructure for sustainability and resilience, but most farmers aren't in the privileged position I'm in of having a supplementary outside source of income. So if we want organic and biodynamic and sustainable agriculture to become mainstream, we have to deal with this. And the way we deal with it, we concluded, and we being a group of NGOs, researchers, academic institutes, foundations, and other people with an interest in, in this area is to identify the so-called, economists call them externalities, that means the, the things which come out of farming systems which are not, uh, on which a value hasn't been put. They might be pollution, uh, emissions, impact on biodiversity, impact on public health, natural capital depletion, social and cultural externalities, and they could be negative and positive. So, for instance, 
you could either have a farming system which has a high level of emissions or it would build soil carbon and take CO2 actually out of the atmosphere. So it's not just about putting a price, first of all identifying what, what all these externalities are and then hopefully quantifying them and then putting the price on them. I'll just give you a very quick example, the example of nitrogen fertilizer. My colleague Richard Young did some work really largely drawing from existing European research on nitrogen. So if a farmer buys a kilogram of nitrogen, it costs about 87 pence. He or she applies it to the land, there's a crop growth response. We know, obviously, that there are some problems with that, fungal diseases and all the rest of it. But the crop growth response is sufficient to give them a two to three pound return on that 87 pence investment. So there is a good business case for using nitrogen fertilizer. But these environmental scientists have calculated that if you cost the emissions, the nitrate pollution, maybe cleaning it up by the water companies, and the public health damage, some of which is not really rock solid, and you add that into the equation, it, it's at least three pounds worth of negative externalities, and it might be as much as nine pounds worth. So in other words, if we practiced true cost accounting to nitrogen fertilizer, farmers would stop using it. That's incredible if you think about it because that's just one externality, but it probably is the key because most of industrial agriculture hinges on the use of nitrogen fertilizer, but there are many other um, downstream consequences from using agricultural inputs, all of which need to be identified, quantified, priced, and then finally we need to develop policy instruments, both carrots and sticks, whereby we can put a price on those externalities and then work out how we can either reward the positive ones or penalise the negative ones so that the farmers get the right economic signals to adjust their practices accordingly. Now, to do this, we need a major study, a kind of Stern-level study with more impact, because although Stern made a, a big public profile impact, it, in fact, it hasn't really caused the actions that were necessary in terms of addressing climate change. So we need a big global report which, which draws to public attention and makes, in simple language, this incredible degree of distortion as accessible as possible. Then after that, we need to work out what the policy instruments were. Well, it'd be very simple with nitrogen. You could put a tax on nitrogen fertilizer in proportion to the damage done. You could recycle the money raised and give it back to sustainable farmers. That would be completely transformative. So we had a series of meetings. We had one in Kentucky and we had a two-day, three-day meeting in London in December last year, during which a group of experts discussed these issues. And out of it, a man called Pavan Sukhdev, who's an Indian guy, who's the father of TEEB, the economics uh, the economics of the environment and biodiversity, where he historically has done a lot of work on natural capital, he decided that there was a need for a major study on the, on the externalities of farming and food systems. And that project now has got EU funding and some funding from the Norwegian government and is getting underway. And I'm hoping that within the next two to three years, there's going to be some considerable public attention brought to these uh, issues which are blocking sustainable food production from being more profitable. And if you think about it, affecting the business case for farmers and therefore banks, including Triodos, because if Triodos are assessing how to spend your money that you've invested in Triodos, they need to back sound business cases. Doing this stuff will unlock it. So this is massively important. What citizens and society can do, that's you and me, I mean, we need to bank ethically. I want to say that because my farming project depends on your investment in Triodos Bank, literally. I wouldn't be on the farm today were it not for Triodos Bank. So I urge you, if you're not already investing in Triodos, to invest in Triodos. We also need to take action as citizens and buy ethically produced food. And we need to get involved with all the very many initiatives that are building better food systems. And we need to recognize that this is gonna cost a greater percentage of our disposable income. That's important, because it will. Because the true cost of healthy food, if we factor all those externalities into it, is going to cost us a greater percentage of our disposable income. If we do all those things I've just been talking about, things will get better. But, you know, it is going to cost more. Now, if I'm allowed, I'm going to end with some pictures of what I'm doing. Because in the end, it's what we do as individual citizens that is going to make the difference. Uh, that's a gathering of people, some of you, you might recognize, some of you might recognize, this is to celebrate our 40th anniversary on the farm, uh, which took place last July, a year ago. So we are farming 135 acres in West Wales, and right from day one, 
uh, we have been avoiding the use of nitrogen fertilizer, pesticides, mostly avoiding the use of antibiotics in our dairy herd as well. Uh, keep going. Uh, that's my family, actually, that's taken a couple of years ago. There's our dairy herd this summer. We've got a herd of Ayrshire's. We've got 84 Ayrshire cows uh, at the moment. I milked them yesterday morning, and uh, they are produced, all their milk is going for cheese making. We're practicing holistic grazing management because we've, we've recognized that we can take our grassland productivity to another level by looking after the soil better. It may sound strange for me to say this after all these years, but I've had a kind of revelation about soil in the last year. and I, could, I realized that we were only at the beginning of what we could do with our soils. We could probably take them to another level of productivity, maybe a 30% increase in stocking rate by laying down these tracks, which we got from stone from the farm and then uh, putting in new water troughs and practicing sort of intensive grazing. Joel Salatin's doing a lot of this in America. Some of you may have heard of him. Next. And this is just what we, this is infrastructure. This is real positive infrastructure. This is investment in what you need to farm properly sustainably. There's a trough, five cows. Keep going, keep going, otherwise it. Clover and clover and grass, nitro, nitrogen fertilizer fixed by clover. That's the engine of the system, more. Dandelions, that's interesting. People think ill of dandelions, they're fantastic. They've got tap roots, they bring up minerals from the subsoil. Cows selectively graze them. Red clover, even more productive than white clover in fixing nitrogen. That's what makes the, fuels the whole system. Making silage, growing our uh, oats and peas. We, we produce oats and peas and we mill and mix them to feed a kind of muesli to our cows uh, because we think that it was wrong to buy sort of globally produced concentrates from all over the world, which we, have, we are doing to a degree, but we've cut our dependency on that. There's the crop growing towards harvest. There it is being combined. There's the cows coming in to be milked. There's me milking earlier this year. That's my son, Ben, uh, child labor unpaid. Um, <laughs> does he look happy? It's a discussion. Um, that's my son, Sam, and his wife, Rachel, uh, that turn our, our milk into a single farm cheese called Havod. And here is our new slurry store. This is more, we need to manage the nutrients better. So the principles that I'm adopting on my farm, building soil fertility, managing nutrients, managing water, practicing the law of return, obeying the principles of diversity and biodiversity. These principles unite every food producer on, on, in the world. It doesn't matter whether you're in Africa, and I've been in Africa a few times in the last few years, or in a hilly, West Wales environment with a lot of rain. The principles are identical. All farmers need to adopt these principles. And if they do, we'll all live happily ever after. <laughs> uh, or will we? That's the trigger for a discussion. Because I think that there's a long way to go if we're to transform our food systems. But with the internet and with the energy that's out there about this discussion now, I think that we're closer to the transformation than we might think on a, on a bad day. So uh, thank you very much for listening to me. Come on, just go on.